be on the outside of the patient's room, preparing all the medication using the drug chart and providing that second double check with the nurse. We would then pass it through to them into the patient's room so they wouldn't have to make as many changes coming into and out of the rooms. The chance that this does give pharmacy and pharmacists to be on the front line and to prove, you know, our worth to the system. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, more pharmacies be able to do this. You know, with any luck, we will see the development of a, a vaccine for COVID-19. And I think we can certainly expect pharmacists to play a role in that. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Every healthcare professional has a unique scope of practice aimed at using their expertise and training to serve the public. Pharmacists are medication therapy experts currently taking on expanded roles to become more involved in patient care. In this episode, we will hear from pharmacists explaining their scope of practice in their respective countries. We will also hear about how the COVID-19 pandemic changed their roles to adapt to the needs of patients and global healthcare systems. Within Canada, we have different scopes of practice through uh, each different province, and there's there's a little bit of nuance as it relates to that. Um, you know, in Alberta, we have uh, pharmacists that have. Uh, full prescribing authority, and and I'm sure in in those cases they were able to help manage uh, patients that maybe weren't able to access care to their physicians or or otherwise. You know, in our practice in Ontario, you know, we certainly saw a little bit more um, flexibility or utilization of of uh, pharmacists extending prescriptions uh, using refill authority. And um, one area where we weren't able to use that authority pre-pandemic is, is in, um, you know, targeted controlled substances, uh, people on, on pain management with opioids and various things. So for those patients um, was helpful. Um, you know, one area that, that's probably been held back, but we'll, we'll, you know, you'll see in the future is, you know, immunization. So, you know, certainly through the pandemic, we didn't see a lot of immunizations happening. Um, but I, I think as um, as you know, case numbers drop and things start to open up, I think we're going to see uh, people prioritize their immunization status, whether it be for pneumonia, certainly as the upcoming flu season comes. Uh, and I think pharmacists are definitely going to play a, a very prominent role in, in that. And, you know, with any luck, we will see the development of a, a vaccine for COVID-19. And I think we can certainly expect pharmacists to play a role in that. And, and uh, in addition to that, I think, you know, we're starting to see signals here in Ontario that the government's um, um, looking harder at, at pharmacists' ability to assess and to treat common ailments, um, you know, which again will, will help to alleviate some of the strain on, on family doctors and walk-in clinics, emergency rooms. One area of, of potential is related to uh, point-of-care testing. And we certainly think that, um, you know, as, as tests are are evaluated and then testing strategy uh, comes out that pharmacists will be able to play a role in um, testing for COVID so that we can help to, um, uh, I guess, safely manage the, the pandemic and, and help our society to operate as normally as I guess we can expect to and until we think we've uh, passed the, the worst of, of, uh, of this disease. So in hospital pharmacy, what it, it hasn't really changed in terms of the scope of practice per se and what hospital pharmacists are doing, but certainly what hospital pharmacists have been involved with the most is in terms of recommending therapeutic alternatives for medications that might be in short supply. Um, and so that involves, you know, generally speaking, collaboration and discussion with other practitioners, such as physicians and nurses, 
um, and communicating that information out once a decision is made in terms of alternatives to be used. And so that's where you'll see pharmacists really exercising um, part of their scope of practice. Another way in which pharmacists have really stepped up, um, and, and I would say that probably most of them have done this independently, is in terms of sort of rearranging medication schedules or um, types of medications that patients are getting to reduce the number of times that a nurse has to go into a patient's room. So whether it's changing from a medication that's given twice daily to being given once daily, uh, trying to find perhaps combination medications if possible, all in the goal of reducing um, the use of PPE and also the risk of exposure to the nurse in terms of how many times she has to go into a patient's room. Um, and another way they've been doing it is in terms of um, longer lines for IV medications to say, you know, is it possible to keep the pump outside of the patient's room? Um, again, reducing the risk of exposure um, to nurses and, and the number of times that a nurse has to go into a patient's room. Well, it's interesting because, you know, what, what happened with the province, you know, quote unquote, shutting down is that many doctor's offices either closed or they significantly reduced their hours, making it very difficult to get in touch with the doctor. You know, the ministry did do, did implement certain measures by making uh, certain phone visits available, so that helped. But you know, what we found was because patients weren't able to see their doctors as readily as before, and then they, a lot of them turned to pharmacists right, as the most accessible healthcare providers. So we found that, you know, people access the pharmacist, they reached out to their pharmacy for, you know, minor ailments, over-the-counter conditions, or even running out of refills. You know, if there are regular patients, then we're able to use our, our scope of practice to extend refills and even potentially adapt in certain cases. So I think it was a really good opportunity for pharmacists to, you know, to flex their expanded scope muscle and show the the public and the ministry and the wider healthcare, uh, the wider healthcare you know or you know organizations that pharmacists do a lot more than just counting pills. So we were able to keep people you know probably out of the emergency and out of walk-in clinics, thereby you know reducing the spread of the pandemic and unnecessary use of healthcare resources. So I think ultimately you know pharmacists did a really good job of stepping up. Uh, in the in the the face of the province and the province closing down a lot of services. Well, I must say that uh, our scope of practice at the beginning wasn't really uh, recognized. I mean, authorities didn't um, give any instructions direct to pharmacists. They um, prepare protocols for doctors, obviously, um, nurses, uh, paramedics, okay? But no one in the, in the beginning uh, referred to pharmacists. We kept doing our job. They simply said, okay, you, you, pharmacists must uh, stay open. You, you, can't, uh, you can't close a pharmacist. And that, and that was it. So our scope of practice was simply keep, keeping doing what we were doing it, keeping um, obviously giving care, uh, we are caregivers, uh, giving um, medications, drugs to uh, people. I told you, we are uh, an elderly country, so there are chronic uh, therapies that have to, co to keep going on uh, and couldn't be stopped. So we simply, let's say, kept doing what we, what was our, our role, our uh, role of practice, scope of practice. Um, so in Washington, we're very lucky in that Washington does acknowledge pharmacists as providers and has for a very long time. Um, in, res in response to COVID, uh, we haven't seen a huge um, chance for us to be engaged much as none of the testing currently is considered CLIA waived. Um, so, you know, most of the testing cannot occur um, in, um, in the pharmacy at this point. Uh, we 
here at both of my stores uh, are um, enrolled in the HHS program uh, through the federal government here. Uh, and so we are a, um, a testing facility. Um, we observe the tests. So these are self-administered tests uh, for, the, um, for the patients. So they drive up um, and uh, they, they go through some, some screening. They, get a, they, they enroll for the testing and then um, they drive up and then are instructed, you know, how to administer the test to themselves. We then observe it and then we ship it off um, to a lab uh, down in California, actually, I believe is who's doing our testing at this point. Um, and so, uh, but there are only, in this program that I'm working with, there are only five pharmacies in the entire state that are doing that. Um, so it's, it's pretty limited at this point. There are a couple of the chain pharmacies out here that um, are also part of the HHS program, but they're administering theirs um, themselves. Um, so, you know, we're still, we're still waiting to see what more it is we can do. Um, I'm also uh, working with some of the health departments trying to figure out what um, the response is going to look like once we have a vaccine come out. And, um, you know, at this point, the vaccine will we're quite certain be closely guarded by the, the government and, um, you know, and, and allocated in that fashion. So trying to figure out um, what the protocols are gonna be, who's gonna be um, doing it. Um, and then as a, as a independent business owner, trying to figure out how we would handle um, the increase in volume um, and, and staff time that would be required, you know, if we were to get, you know, 100, vaccinations dropped on our lap every day you know um, we couldn't we couldn't accommodate that with just the staff that we have at this point um, the testing right now um, alone has us pretty uh, pretty limited um, staff wise um, in the store so we've pulled a, a technician off of the line all day um, every weekday at this point so we're essentially running one one man down in the pharmacy and then considering adding you know, the vaccine vaccinations come the fall or, you know, winter when they become available. And then if there does become um, a CLIA waived uh, test that we can administer through the pharmacy as well. Um, so trying to juggle all of that right now, um, trying to figure out where all of this fits, what we can do to help the community. I mean, I'm committed to this program that we're doing right now because it's necessary for the community, um, you know, as I say, my staff is being pulled in all directions um, at this point, just trying to keep up. Um, so it's been pretty hard on them. I try to fill in where I can. I'll be doing the testing as soon as I'm done here today, um, just to give them a little bit of a break. Uh, but it's you know um, the next the next six months to a year is um, it's gonna it's gonna be a lot. Although I, I appreciate the um, the chance that this does give pharmacy and pharmacists to be on the front line and to prove, you know, our worth to the system. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, more pharmacies be able to do this and, um, and you know, hopefully get, uh, you know, a little more uh, forward thinking in a pharmacist as a provider and this is where you can come for, for these sorts of, of um, services. So we'll see. In the state of California, we had an advanced provider status that was passed many years ago, allowing for pharmacists to manage chronic disease in collaboration with physicians. And so what we've been doing as pharmacists is trying to assist our physician colleagues in the management of chronic disease because that really fell by the wayside as we were focusing on controlling you know, the coronavirus spread and the treatment of patients who were hospitalized. Um, so there was this really quick shift in healthcare back in March from in-person clinic visits to telehealth and remote healthcare delivery. And so as a pharmacist, I quickly learned how to do telehealth to be able to conduct uh, office visits with patients um, in my practice with kidney disease to maintain some continuity of care during the time that we weren't seeing patients in the clinic. 
And that was very challenging, uh, certainly because as clinicians, we weren't employing telehealth anywhere near the level that we're employing it now. So it was a very big learning curve for us to be able to deliver that type of care. And many things came up in terms of the role of the pharmacist. Um, as an example, I see patients with the nephrologist at the same time in an office visit. I will go in and conduct a medication history and then provide my recommendations to the nephrologist on how to optimize medication outcomes. And then the nephrologist goes in after me and um, does a physical exam, puts all the information together, finalizes the care plan, and then we order medicines for our patient. And so when you translate that workflow to a telehealth remote delivery, it becomes challenging to, um, to be able to you know, translate the workflow, as I said, and having multiple providers on the same visit, a video visit with a patient um, using a platform that's obviously secure and, you know, will maintain patient confidentiality. So we worked through all of those issues and I am proud to say that I utilized my skills as a pharmacist to really help maintain outcomes during a time where it was really difficult to do that. Generally, what our, our role is, we aim for what we say about a 70% clinical role, so ward-facing, patient-facing role in the hospitals. Um, and that, for example, in my hospital involves a sort of a eight till five ward pharmacy service where we will come to the wards to supply medication, to counsel patients, to um, complete medication histories, medicines reviews, and all that sort of thing. Um, our role changed during the pandemic in that we were advised wherever possible to work remotely. So for example, our critical care areas work um, on electronic prescribing systems. So we set up a process whereby we didn't need to go to the wards to reduce the risk to us, but also to help preserve PPE. Um, so we were working remotely and we had sort of scheduled times where we would check in with nurses and check in with medics so that we could provide advice, they could ask us questions, and we sort of set up more dedicated phone lines and things for that sort of thing. So that we, the hope was that, and I think it did work, that we could provide the same level of care without the, the actual sort of physical presence on the wards to do that. Now, the majority of the wards in our hospital don't have electronic prescribing systems. So we were, for example, the surgical wards that I look after, um, I was still going up there every day um, and, and how we split our wards or how we at least tried to do it as best we could was sort of a traffic light system of sort of green wards which were deemed COVID clean where you could just wear normal sort of a mask and gloves if you're interacting with a patient all the way through to needing to wear sort of full PPE where we wear scrubs and, and the FFP3 masks and that sort of thing and we would be doing that on the wards if we didn't have um, if we were using a paper-based system because what we also wanted to discourage was it's sort of the old pharmacy model where for example nursing staff would bring drug charts down to a dispensary and say I need this drug because that would then involve them to move from a, a dirty area so an area in which potentially they were interacting with COVID patients to move to a dispensary environment that we are keeping clean as we've as we sort of tried to call it so we would go to the wards and then we would wear whatever kit they needed us to wear for that. And then we would change back into our normal uniforms when we left that area. So I think we were probably more hands on in that respect because we wanted to discourage and it was, it was two elements. We wanted to discourage the sort of the mixing of the clean and the dirty wards. And we also recognised the increased pressures, particularly on nurses and that anything we could do to facilitate that, um, we would. Uh, one, one other thing that some hospitals were doing and we were being trained up to do was more around medicines administration, um, which we never needed to do in our hospital in the end. Um, but another thing that nurses were finding particularly difficult was that because of the number of changes of clothing and and sort of protective equipment between each patient, it meant that drug rounds were extending for, from sort of an hour long for their eight patients or whatever to several hours. 
um, because of the changes they had to do in between. So one role that we were going to have and our technicians were going to have, would it have been needed, was to, um, to be on the outside of the patient's room, preparing all the medication using the drug chart and providing that second double check with the nurse. We would then pass it through to them into the patient's room so they wouldn't have to make as many changes coming into and out of the rooms and all that sort of thing. So we were almost acting a bit like a runner, but also we had the, the sort of the clinical knowledge knowledge and we could make things up and do it in a safe way um, so some of us were upskilled to do that which obviously we wouldn't normally do because we don't get involved in the administration per se but in the end we, we didn't need to because it, it just fortunately just never got that bad in our in our hospital but I think the only other real change we did is that we moved to a seven-day working pattern so it's basically accepted across our workforce that we all agreed that the difference between a Saturday and a Sunday and a Monday to Friday was irrelevant because we couldn't go anywhere or do anything with the weekend anyway. So we all entered onto a rotor whereby we had the same number of staff in Monday to Sunday. So the wards from their point of view could appreciate that there was no difference in the sort of the pharmacy setup throughout the week. And it just meant that that consistency was there. Whereas in the current model, you probably have four or five pharmacists in on a Saturday compared to somewhere nearer. 40 to 50 throughout the week. En el país no es como la no es como Canadá, no es como Europa, que los farmacéuticos están en las farmacias. La situación es un poco penosa por esto porque en Ecuador cada farmacia tiene su auxiliar de farmacia que no tiene nada que ver con un farmacéutico y ellos son los que generalmente atienden en las farmacias. El farmacéutico lo único que hace es darle su firma. Que una farmacia no puede pagarle el sueldo a un farmacéutico y los farmacéuticos generalmente trabajan en empresas que hacen fármacos, en el sector público controlando medicamentos, en el sector privado eh, manejando medicamentos pero desde puntos de control centralizados, que acá los conocemos como coordinaciones zonales o como la planta central de tanto del Instituto Ecuatoriano de Seguridad Social o de parte del Ministerio de Salud Pública. La práctica farmacéutica antes y después de la pandemia no ha cambiado, seguimos teniendo muchísimas falencias, el trabajo en sí más se ve dentro de hospitales, se ve dentro de centros de salud en los cuales sí hay una atención farmacéutica, pero por parte eh, pública. La única diferencia es que ahora usamos las mascarillas, usamos los guantes, utilizamos los trajes de protección y utilizamos la, las viseras. Eh, respecto a cómo estamos ayudando los farmacéuticos en primera línea, generalmente se ve dentro de centros de salud y dentro de hospitales. Como les digo, aquí están los farmacéuticos. Están en estos centros o pues están de forma centralizada haciendo la adquisición de medicamentos para diferentes hospitales públicos. ¿Cómo estamos aportando? Pues estamos ayudando a eh, abastecer a las farmacias para que los médicos tengan a su mano los medicamentos y los fármacos que ellos necesitan para poder eh, tratar a los pacientes con COVID. In Nigeria, I don't know. I really do not know how it's done outside in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Many of our, many of many of our people here, once there's any need for a medical attention, the first place most times they go to is the community pharmacy to talk to the pharmacist on how they feel, whatever is wrong with them. Then the pharmacist, from his assessment, from his uh, consultation, will now like to know what to do next. Whether you'll be um, transferred to the hospital for more intensive care or you'll be recommended some medications. So what basically pharmacists are doing during this COVID-19 pandemic season is to ensure every patient or client that comes to the pharmacy is being informed because getting the right information about um, a pandemic like this goes a long way because there are different people, different things being circulated on social media that are misleading people, you know, when you're not getting the right information, that is another problem on its own. So the pharmacists have made it their duty and responsibility to educate, inform, 
and then also reassure the patient or client that okay, yes, we're going through um, this pandemic this season. It doesn't mean it's, it's not like a death sentence. It doesn't mean oh, everybody's going to die. You know, there's this level of assurance the pharmacist needs to give whoever visits the pharmacy. So the education has to be on point. You have to make sure your clients, your patients are aware of what is happening in their surroundings. And then the pharmacists are they're also responsible for um, ensuring the rational use of drugs, like safe and effective use of drugs, because there's tendency of people wanting to abuse medications all because they are scared of dying, you know? Seeing people around you getting infected, you're hearing news every day of how the cases are increasing, you're hearing news of people that have died, oh, nobody wants to die. So everybody just wants to swallow medications. So, so there's a real tendency of uh, abuse happening. So it's the duty and responsibility of the pharmacist to ensure that the patient gets the right information about drugs and medication and then curb any form of abuse. So these are part of the practice. These are part of the things pharmacists are doing, being in front line of this pandemic. We might not be dealing directly with um, patients that are already infected, but we are also playing a very, very important role in educating and making sure the patients or clients do the right thing at the right time. And then if you notice any patient that is also showing signs or symptoms based on the complaint, they brought to your pharmacy, it is the duty and responsibility of the pharmacy to refer to the appropriate centers for the next intervention to be made. So from the pharmacy point of view, okay, so at some point, uh, Singapore has actually um, enforce the, you know, the so-called uh, circuit breaker measurement, which means uh, non-essential non service will not be, um, you know, uh, running as per normal for a certain period of time. And so those patients who are well, uh, they may have to reschedule their appointment. So the hospital will be focusing on uh, more acute cases rather than the usual um, you know, the usual outpatient follow-up. So all these appointments, either they will go through a tele-health or tele-consultation, and then the pharmacy side to ensure that the medications, you know, since they have postponed the appointment, we have to ensure that their medications are sufficient until the next one. So um, in during this period, our medication delivery system, the medication delivery service, you know, in short, we call it MDS, uh, actually are up and running very um, aggressively. So usually our MDS service may not be, have so many cases, you know, because of this COVID pandemic, uh, the service. Um, so we have to modify a little bit of our usual workflow. So we do have um, quite a couple of outpatient pharmacy. So one of them has to actually um, channel all the, the, the manpower and the energy to handle the medication delivery service, you know, and then we um, redirect our patients who need to come to the hospital for more acute uh, treatment to other pharmacy to get their medication. Yeah. So as you understand, because a lot of countries are actually under lockdown as well, not only Singapore, um, so there are a lot of um, supply chain issues, you know, and also because in, there's increase in number of um, medication required for all the patients, especially in the ICU. So we do have, um, so our hospital or our Ministry of Health, uh, more so our Chief Pharmacist Office, in the Ministry of Health actually um, have set up a task force and get all the ICU pharmacists in Singapore together uh, to form a liaison group. And we are looking at um, actually how we go about um, monitoring the, a few of the critical ICU medications, you know, and actually how 
uh, we will together come up with uh, drug ICU drug conservation uh, strategies. Yeah, just to ensure that you know our critically ill patients. Should we have that surge of the number of patients in ICU, we do have adequate um, medication to treat them. 